if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And I've been sitting on this for months now. Wanted to do this a month, one a month ago, but yeah. Between my procrastination, editing issues, my procrastination, and family things, I've been. I didn't do this a month ago when, I, when this came out. So finally, one month later, give or take, maybe more now, I am finally reacting to the finale. Of Checkmate Weekend Nights. Oh boy. It's always check. I don't say I do this often, but watch the original video too. If you haven't watched it yet. Let's see how my reaction is. Probably terrible. But oh, let's do this. You know, Johnny, I'm not going to do this if you're not going to listen. I'll listen, Billy. I will. It's just, it's not easy for me. Mm. Do you mean that, though? Or are you just saying it? My mind is open. Convince me if you can. All right. See. We've talked about a lot of Southern history on this show, from 1776 to the modern day. But there's one thing we've never actually touched on, the Confederacy's founding documents. What the governments and politicians of southern states themselves said, loudly and publicly, in 1860 and 61, justifying their secession. The secession documents. Really? That's your big last move? <laughs> I ain't no spring chicken, Billy. And this ain't Civil War History 101. Trust me, I don't think you know just how deep this goes and how crazy it gets. <laughs> Okay, so here's what happened. On December 24th, 1860, the South Carolina Secession Convention drafts a Declaration of Immediate Causes of Separation, wherein they state, The non-slaveholding states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions. They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted the open establishment among them of abolitionist societies, whose avowed object is to take away the property of the civilians of other states. They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes, and those who remain have been incited to servile insurrection. Mississippi seceded on January 9th, 1861, and about two weeks later, their secession convention drafted its own declaration. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the wow. world. Utter subjugation awaits us in the Union if we should consent longer to remain in it. It is not a matter of choice, but of necessity. We must either submit to degradation and to the loss of property worth four billions of money, or we must secede from the Union framed by our fathers. Florida wow. seceded just a day after Mississippi, declaring that all hope of the preservation of the Federal Union upon terms consistent with the safety and honor of the slaveholding states has finally dissipated by the recent indications of the strength of the anti-slavery sentiment in the free states. Alabama, following suit on January 11th, a sectional party known as the Black Republican Party, and they mean black in a racial sense, has in the recent election elected Abraham Lincoln to the office of president upon the avowed principle that the Constitution of the United States does not recognize property and slaves, no. and that the government should prevent its extension into the common territories of the United States, and that the power of the government should be so exercised that slavery in time should be exterminated. Georgia's report on the causes of secession, drafted on January 29th, yes. harps on a similar theme. This is the party to whom the people of the North have committed the government. The prohibition of slavery in the territories, hostility to it everywhere, the equality of the black and white races, disregard of all constitutional guarantees in its favor, were boldly proclaimed by its leaders and applauded by its followers. 
Louisiana didn't draft a declaration when they seceded on January 26th, but the state government, fearful that they might have to fight Texas and the Civil War sure to follow, sent a diplomat named George Williamson to the Lone Star State to extensively lay out their reasons for secession and urge Texans to join them in rebellion. People of Louisiana would consider it a most fatal blow to African slavery if Texas should not join her destinies to theirs in a southern confederacy. If she remains in the Union, the abolitionists would continue their work of incendiarism and murder. Emigrant aid societies would arm with sharps rifles, predatory bands to infest her northern borders. Williamson's words, which called to mind the horrible specter of John Brown's raid with its reference to slave insurrection and sharps rifles, may have had an impact. Text Please join us. Don't hurt us. Yeah. His declaration, drafted early in February, expounded on the idea that not only was slavery at stake, but also white supremacy. Northern people have formed themselves into a great sectional party, now strong enough in numbers to control the affairs of each of those states, based upon the unnatural feeling of hostility to these southern states and their beneficent and patriarchal system of African slavery, proclaiming the debasing doctrine of the equality of all men, irrespective of race or color, a doctrine at war with nature in opposition to the experience of mankind, and in violation of the plainest revelations of divine law. Okay, Betty. I'll grant you that there is no debate that the secession of the original seven Confederate states was to preserve the institution of slavery. Yet it is not until Lincoln calls up 75,000 volunteers to invade, yes, I said invade those states, that Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina leave the Union. That's true. The Upper South stayed on the fence for a long time during the secession crisis. And it's not hard to see why. If they left the Union, the northernmost slaveholding states would certainly be hit hardest by the subsequent war. So it made sense that they would hold out for a compromise as long as possible. So we agree. Slavery was not the sole cause for secession. No, oh, I never said that. <laughs> the prospect of abolition and racial equality terrified the whites of the Upper South just as desperately as it did those of the Deep South. Then why were there slaveholding states in the Union during and after the Civil War? Because despite the apocalyptic prognostications of the planter class, Lincoln didn't actually want to get rid of slavery in 1860. I mean, haven't you told me that once or twice when you're trying to take Lincoln's reputation as the great emancipator down a peg? But all the slave states of the Upper South, even the border states that ended up staying in the Union, were sharply divided on the issue of secession. In some states, the fire eaters got their way. In others, the Unionists won out. Plus, the Upper South had a lower population of slaves and one as economically dependent on the institution. That's where your emancipationist historiography falls flat, Billy. It's all about money at the end of the day. Even with slavery, it leads back to the dollar dollar bill, y'all. Economics are a big part of it, for sure. But one aspect that's gone critically overlooked is just how enormous a role white supremacy played in all this. When the Upper South was still waffling, the states of the Deep South sent commissioners up north to try to convince their sister slave states to join their newfound confederacy. The commissioners were well aware of the Upper South's political pressure points. And in their letters and speeches, they didn't focus on the economics of slavery. Instead, their pleas placed the preservation of racial hierarchy front and center. As John Smith Preston, South Carolina's commissioner to Virginia, announced to a packed house in Richmond in a speech that February, For nearly 30 years, the people of the non-slaveholding states have assailed the institution of African slavery in every form in which our political connection with them permitted them to approach it. During all that period, large masses of abolitionists, mad by the intoxication of the wildest fanaticism have associated with the avowed purpose of affecting the abolition of slavery by the most fearful means which can be suggested to a subject race, namely the annihilation of its people by servile insurrection. Southern civilization cannot exist without African slavery. Destroy involuntary labor and Anglo-Saxon civilization must be remitted to the latitudes whence it sprung. Preston's speech was frequently interrupted by waves of applause and was widely praised by local newspapers, one of which reported that at one point the whole audience was in tears. Stephen Hale, Alabama's commissioner to Kentucky, left 
absolutely no room for ambiguity in his letter to Governor Beriah McGuffin. The triumph of the Republican Party destroys the property of the South, lays waste her fields, and inaugurates all the horrors of a San Domingo servile insurrection, consigning her citizens to assassinations and her wives and daughters to pollution and violation to gratify the lust of half-civilized Africans. The slaveholder and non-slaveholder must ultimately share the same fate. All be degraded to a position of equality with free Negroes. Stand side by side with them at the polls and fraternize in all the social relations of life. Who? Oh. Wow. Just... Wow. And some of them still feel that way, I think. Some, some things haven't changed very much in over 100 years. Who can look upon such a picture without a shudder? What southern man, be he slaveholder or non-slaveholder, can without indignation and horror contemplate the triumph of Negro equality? White supremacy enforced by violent enslavement was so integral to the cultural fabric of the American South, so taken for granted as natural, necessary, and normal by nearly its entire white population, that Mississippi Commissioner William Harris spoke for many when he said, Mississippi had rather see the last of her race, men, women, and children, immolated in one common funeral pyre than to see them subjected to the degradation of civil, political, and social equality with the Negro race. So what kind of effect did the commissioner's overtures and the broader zeitgeist of white supremacist fervor have on the states of the Upper South? Well, we only need to look at their declarations of secession to find out. Virginia was finally forced to choose a side after South Carolina militia fired on Fort Sumter in April 1861. Just days earlier, the state's secession convention had declared that, Whereas African slavery is a vital part of the social system of the states wherein it exists, and as that form of servitude existed when the Union was formed, and the jurisdiction of the several states over it within their respective limits was recognized by the Constitution, any interference to its prejudice by the federal authority or by the authorities of other states or by the people thereof is in derogation from plain right, contrary to the Constitution, offensive and dangerous. Ow. I want to take my slaves away, they say. It's, it's our state right to keep them. Again, I say... Wow. That seems to me like an argument ultimately stemming from states' rights. I would argue that it's more of a reflection of the Southern rights nationalism we talked about in Episode 8. But yeah, Virginia was on the whole much more moderate. There you had lots of influential pro-slavery unionists like your boy Bobby Lee, who in 1860 believed that preserving slavery from outside interference was absolutely essential, but decried the Deep South's actions as illegal and revolutionary. Virginia's delegates on the secession convention were shrewd politicians. They knew that white supremacist fear-mongering alone wasn't enough to win over the moderates, but a strong argument made for the constitutionality of secession just might. On May 6th, Arkansas, which had been vainly attempting all winter and spring to broker a compromise, finally took the plunge and declared independence. Its secession convention had already written a document explaining their reasons. People of the northern states have organized a political party, purely sectional in character, the central and controlling idea of which is hostility to the institution of African slavery. They have, in disregard of their constitutional obligation, obstructed the faithful execution of the fugitive slave laws by enactments of their state legislatures. They have degraded American citizens by placing them upon an equality with Negroes. Like Virginia, North Carolina also had strong Unionist sentiments, especially in the mountainous western part of the state, where the terrain made large-scale plantation slavery impossible. After the attack on Fort Sumter, Governor John Ellis finally called the Secession Convention with the following proclamation. It is nearly unique among secession documents in that it makes no mention of slavery directly. I am informed that 
Abraham Lincoln has made a call for 75,000 men to be employed for the invasion of the peaceful homes of the South. United action in defense of the sovereignty of North Carolina and of the rights of the South becomes now the duty of all. Tennessee had a large population of Appalachian Unionists too, but their secession documents were far more radical. A month before they officially seceded, the state legislature issued a public address to its citizens, declaring their intention to do so. Tennessee has taken her position and has proudly determined to throw her banners to the breeze and will give her strength to the sacred cause of freedom for the white man of the South. Sir, I'm afraid that you are confusing the causes of war with the cause of secession. The two are linked, but not the same. Secession may have been about slavery, but the decision to inaugurate war was entirely Lincoln's. The Federals could have just let the South peaceably go. Johnny, buddy, you're my brother and I love you, but that's incredibly fucking naive. Nation states will always act in the interests of self-preservation if it's at all within their power to do so. Even cute, cuddly, democratic ones with inspiring quotes about liberty and justice for all printed in their passports. But it doesn't have to be that way. I'm with you, man. And, and look, I'm not trying to make a moral judgment about it or be cynical here, but that's kind of just the way the cookie crumbles. And when you look at the circumstances of the secession crisis, it's hard to imagine Lincoln acting in any other way than he did. The balkanization of America was a truly existential threat to the federal government. Uh, prominent Confederates were very open about their plans to eclipse the United States as a continental power. Secession was such a severe blow to national pride, such an egregious insult to the federal government's efficacy and credibility that it demanded an equally drastic response. But there were people at the time, North and South, who criticized Lincoln's call for troops and believed that the whole thing could be resolved peacefully. I would argue that even in the context of the time, and without the benefit of hindsight, these people had delusions of constitutional grandeur. <laughs> Everybody with their head on straight in 1860 and 61 knew that secession would mean armed conflict of some kind. They knew it. And for the fire eaters of the South, a civil war was a far lesser calamity when compared to the prospect of racial equality. They believed the explicitly white supremacist Heron Volk democracy of the new Confederacy was well worth fighting for. The most famous evangelist of this new vision of American government in 1861 was ironically a man who had up until then been a staunch unionist, Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens. On March 21st, 1861, a crowd of 2,000 people gathered in the Athenium Theater in Savannah, Georgia to hear Stevens speak about the core principles of the fledgling Confederacy. He had only just returned home to Georgia after attending the Confederate Constitutional Convention in Montgomery, Alabama, wherein he had played a major role. Mounting the stage to a thunderous applause. Aren't they going to talk about the Constitutional Convention of the Confederates here? I don't know. It's it was like the Arctic Federation that the United States tried. By the way, if you want to hear more about that? Check out the link up up there. If I remember to put it in of the video we did on that one. Was he said? We are in the midst of one of the greatest epochs of our history. The last 90 days will mark one of the most memorable eras in the history of modern civilization. Many governments have been founded on the principles of subordination and serfdom of certain classes of the same race. Such were and are in violation of nature's laws. Our system commits no such violation. With us, the white race, however high or low, rich or poor, are equal in the eyes of the law. Not so with the Negro. Subordination is his place. I suspected the cornerstone speech would rear its ugly head at some point in this episode. Are you gonna conveniently leave out the part where Stevens talks about tariffs? Yeah, he's got a few tariff zingers in there, which is also kind of ironic because he was in favor of protectionism for most of his political career. Like we've talked about before, protectionist tariffs didn't do the South any favors doesn't change the fact that slavery was the reason for secession. Yeah, but all that racist stuff was just like Alexander Stevens' opinion, man. It's not like he was speaking for every confederate ever. How is this an outlying opinion after all the other quotes that I've just shown you? Stevens had his finger on the pulse of the white south and he knew it. But what you Yankees fail to mention 
was that the Cornerstone speech was improvised. The vice president did not have prepared remarks that evening. No, but he had given near identical speeches a number of times in the weeks prior, namely in Atlanta and Augusta, where he used the same white supremacist rhetoric and was met with the same enthusiastic reception. Okay, but I heard that President Davis was dismayed at the lack of political tact exhibited by his vice president. To Davis's amazement, Stevens bypassed the all-important constitutional guarantee of state rights and emphasized the institution of slavery. Could anything, he wondered, have been more calculated to damage the Confederate cause, both in the North and abroad, than his vice president's unfortunate speech? <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that rumor too. Trouble is, there's no primary source documentation to prove it. And as far as I can tell, it was made up in the 1950s. Do you have one? Um, and years later. What? Do you have any primary source documentation to back up what you're saying there, bud? No. Primary sources. No, I, I guess not. And if it did bother Davis when Confederate politicians speechified in defense of slavery, then he sure didn't practice what he preached. Just a few weeks later, Davis gave an address to the Confederate Congress in which he said, The Republican Party seeks not to promote the general welfare or ensure domestic tranquility, but to awaken the bitterest hatred against the citizens of sister states by violent denunciations of their institutions. In moral and social conditions, the African slaves have been elevated from brutal savages into docile, intelligent, and civilized agricultural laborers, and supplied not only with bodily comforts, but with careful religious instruction. Under the supervision of a superior race, their labor has been so directed as not only to allow a gradual and marked amelioration of their own condition, but to convert hundreds of thousands of square miles of the wilderness into cultivated lands covered with a prosperous people. Johnny, my dear friend, in the Cornerstone speech, Alexander Stevens revealed what lay at the heart of the Confederate experiment. In the words of historian Charles Dew, the absolute conviction that the abolition of slavery would either plunge the South into a race war or so stain the blood of the white race that it would be contaminated for all time. The slave republic of the Confederate states would emulate the revolutionary struggle of the founding fathers, but fix what they believed had been their biggest mistake. As Stevens put it, the prevailing ideas of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. Those ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This was an error. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundation are laid. Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition. Mm. Look, man, I'm running out of ways to say it here. The Civil War was caused by slavery. It was. Are you finally ready to accept that truth. Is he? Uh, oh, 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 get him out of here! Go! Go! Stop your sniveling, soldier. You are a man of the Southern Confederacy. Comport yourself as such. 
This is the powerful ally which you spoke of. It is, my president. Forgive his weakness. The enemy has filled his mind with dangerous notions. It is nothing that cannot be corrected, given time and attention. Rise! Tell me, soldier, what has that little blue friend of yours been telling you? That the Civil War was fought over slavery. That... That the Confederacy tried to destroy America for the worst reasons possible. That we... We were wrong. <laughs> well, if slavery is wrong, baby, I don't want to be right. <laughs> Your friend is correct. We did secede because we wanted to keep slavery. And you know what? Slavery. It's fucking great. No, it's evil, selfish, cruel. You'll see. You and the whole white race. I don't know what you're missing. Don't you want to be on top, in control? Of course you do. Once we've completed our conquest, I'll open the markets back up. In New Orleans, Charleston, hell, even Washington, D.C. Do you really think those latte-sipping white liberals will stick to their self-righteous virtue signaling once they've gotten a taste of power? Real power! No. Uh. They'll be lining up just to shake my hand and thank me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jenny. You're a good old rebel, ain't you? <laughs> uh. I don't. It is pointless to resist, my friend. You are one of us. You always have been. Take your place at our side, and together, we will do great things. This is getting interesting. Who's this? Good. You're awake. Where am I? Welcome to the world headquarters of the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment. <sighs> Friendly soldiers. Thank God. Listen, there's something freaky going on. The dead walk the earth. They, they took my friend. We gotta go in there. Guns blazing! Lay down, sir. You've been injured and you need to rest. Oh. 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 You guys got ammunition? Weapons? Of course. Well, uh, not like live rounds. <laughs> that would. <laughs> uh, I think I should clarify a bit. We're not soldiers um, in the traditional sense. We're more living historians, now, or we prefer to be called experimental archaeologists. <laughs> you guys are reenactors. We are. And we take it very seriously. We're all about respecting the men that we're interpreting, but we're not like intense about it. We're not, we're not those reenactors. <laughs> we're, uh, we're actually very chill. I'm Josh. I'm the colonel uh, of this regiment. Pleased to meet you. I'm. Well, we all know who you are. We're huge Checkmate Lincolnites fans here. Oh. I think you should do an episode on Reconstruction. I've, I've got this uh, uh, John Brown didn't do anything wrong t-shirt that I love to wear around my uncle because he's, he's kind of a, a heritage not hate kind of guy. You know? he's a, um, I'm sorry, I, I sound stupid. Oh, my... Josh, honey, I didn't realize you were here with your little friends. Would you like some treats? <laughs> Lemon squares, you love those. Not now, Mom. Uh, you sure? Actually, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's uh, great. <laughs> uh, it was lovely to meet all of you. Um, 
I gotta go. My friend got kidnapped by a Sam Raimi movie, and I'm gonna go get him back. With all due respect, sir, I don't think that that's gonna be a good idea. A skeleton army of undead confederates led by the resurrected mummy of President Jefferson Davis rampaged across the southeastern <laughs> United back. States today with the stated intention of, quote, restoring the white race to its former glory in the cotton states, leaving the markets in absolute chaos. Oh, and also thousands of people are dead, apparently, as we learned from this Atlanta woman who has been hiding from the skeletons in, get this, her bathroom. Her hilarious videos pleading for someone to come rescue her and her family have since gone viral on TikTok with the whole internet calling, quote, bathroom girl, <laughs> the lol cow of the summer and she's joining us on the program today bathroom girl <laughs> welcome to the show please help us they're they're right outside they don't sleep <laughs> they've already killed my parents i'm about to cut you off that, okay that's enough i think we need to hear from the other side of wow. this issue joining us as well is Oberfuhr klaus the necromancer who actually resurrected the army of the dead and unleashed them upon America. Klaus, thanks for joining us today. What do you think of what Bathroom Girl here just said? Well, this is just so typical of the left, uh, always playing the victim. I mean, what's next? It's resisting the skeleton army today, then transgender marriage tomorrow. Where does it end? Wow, that's a really good point. That's a really good point, my lord. Yes, excuse me, my lord. A thousand apologies. Why are you giving this guy airtime? He is clearly a Nazi. Ah, there it is. Everyone you disagree with is a Nazi, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> David, I think your audience is smart enough to see this for the deep state psyop that it is. No, look at what he's wearing. Look what he's wearing? How would you feel if our genders were reversed and you said that to me? Oh boy. The mummy of President Davis will stop at nothing to reestablish his fallen confederacy. And once that's accomplished, Oberfuhr Klaus will doubtless use the power of the sword of Baron Samadu to engulf the world in chaos, bending humanity to his unspeakable will. And as far as time traveling Nazi warlocks go, Klaus is up there. I mean, he is the big one. But he's not invincible. There is one man who might be able to destroy him. Of course. Episode 4. The highly problematic Puritan man who exercised Johnny Reb. His name is the Witchfinder General of the Colony of Massachusetts Bay. That's his name? Yeah. Come with me. I've got something to show you. My day job is in theoretical physics. Are you familiar with interdimensional travel? Just the basics, you know? <laughs> multiple universes, multiple versions of me and you, etc. Precisely. There are quadrillions of versions of our Oberfuhr Klaus across the multiverse. Some got picked up by Operation Paperclip. Others killed themselves on Joe Rogan. Some got their faces melted off by a meaningless plastic YouTube award. Yeah, well that all sounds very plausible. But our Klaus is not like the others. Our Klaus is much, much more powerful. Sometime in the 1930s, our Klaus was dabbling in the occult when he came across the secret to some dark cosmic magic. <laughs> what he found and what he did with it, we don't know. But what we do know is he obtained godlike powers, immortality, sorcery, the ability to travel through time and dimensions at will. Great. But what he doesn't know is, he's not the only one in the multiverse with the ability to travel through worlds. An interdimensional and time travel portal. Oh. Achieved not through the darkness of the occult, but through the light of the scientific method. This one's definitely more sci-fi than the other ones. Less facts about the some war. Well, fact the beginning, but now we're getting, we're getting to more drama. 
Is this safe? Um, well, of course it is. It's just a prototype, but with the right calculations and a little elbow grease, I've managed to open a wormhole to the colony of Massachusetts Bay in the year 1692. There, you'll find the one man who can help us banish this evil forever. Wait, I'm sorry, me? As in by myself? Yep. See you in a bit. <laughs> Witchfinder General, I need your help. Return to hell for your blasted shade. Thou wilt not deceive me as thou didst King Sal. Whoa, whoa, man, uh, take it easy. Uh, uh, look, look, uh, I'm not a demon, okay? I'm, I'm from the future. The theater? The kingdom of God is at hand. The Lord shall return in a matter of months, so I expect. The race and satanical happenings in Salem hath all but confirmed it. No, no, man, look, the world isn't ending because you killed innocent people and kicked off a really tacky tourist industry, okay? I'm telling you, the dead are coming back to life in the year 2024. Then answer me this. Who is the most popular playwright in 2024? I don't know, maybe William Shakespeare? William Shakespeare? The actor? <sighs> My fleshy casement seems real enough. I wonder if it blades. No, 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 no. I have of late suffered from terrible dreams. Wondrous and most strange. I wake screaming in the night, and in me mind's eye, I see that face. Somehow I missed it because I popped off to the kitchen to get a beer. But in episode four of my web series, you faced off against this guy, Klaus, and you defeated him. Now he's back and he's more dangerous than ever and you might be the only being in the multiverse capable of stopping him once and for all. He's like a, he's like a Nazi, but he's much more than that. He, he's inhuman. He's like some kind of demon. A demon of the pit. Very well, Fiatr man. I shall fight alongside there. This blade hath feasted on the blood of many a cavalier soldier. Oh wow, badass. And many Indian savages. See, that I don't like. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. But all the woke history books of the war for southern independence are finally burnt to ashes. The truth will at last prevail. Indeed, my president. Uh, however, I have been meaning to tell you for some time now, there is this new thing called the internet. With the internet, a foul Jewish-controlled woke historian needs no book to spread his anti-white ideas. Instead, he can broadcast messages all the way across town. Then bring me this internet. It too must be destroyed. An ingenious notion, my president, uh, but if I may be so bold as to suggest, this internet is a tool we can use to our advantage. I myself am a major shareholder in Meta, Alphabet, and of course my beloved X. Allow me to contact some of my friends in Silicon Valley. I have no doubt we can come to some sort of arrangement. That money, what of you, Oberfuhrer Klaus? As you please, then. It shall be done, my president. Why, yes, hello, Mark. Remember how you were asking me how it is I have not aged in 70 years? Would you like to know my secret? And no, it isn't just face cream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, here's the situation. The Army of the Confederate dead have burned every library of Civil War books in America. 
That's all except for one. The museum archives at the Gettysburg National Military Park. That'll be their final objective. That is where we make our stand. I have news, sir. What is it? Just received word. Klaus has taken control of the internet. God help us. Well. No, 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 the show. It's gone. It's gone! He must have scrubbed it from the servers. No! It's like someone stabbed the Mona Lisa! The greatest work of art that the world has ever seen. Just gone? Anybody got a smoke? Didn't have backup copies. <laughs> I always have backup copies. In case YouTube does this. Say, class. Any news of uh, old Billy Yank? Old Billy boy? Uh, yeah, he is up there in those hills with his untermensches, race traitors and degenerates attempting to make a futile final stand against the unstoppable might of our army. Sure wish I could see him again. Haven't seen him since before the war. Never thought it would last this long. What, three days? Last time we saw each other, we were debating the cornerstone speech and the declarations of secession before we all went off to fight against each other. Old friends off to war. The soldiers farewell. Goodbye. Good luck. See you in hell. Listen, how long is this going to take? I'm quite busy shitposting on AR15.com. Billy was like a brother to me, remember? <laughs> Last night we saw each other. It was getting late in the evening. Then things got a little rough. Skeletons broke in, violently took me prisoner, and well, there were a lot of tears. I ain't seen him since. But one of these days, I will see him, I'm afraid. Across that small, deadly space. And kill him. I thought about sitting this one out, but that wouldn't feel right. I've got to do my duty as a soldier. Thanks, Klaus. Ha. I needed to get that off my chest. Sorry, what? House. Johnny, prepare for me. <laughs> yeah, mine president. Men of the Southland. A new power is rising. Its victory is at hand. Tonight, the land will be stained with the blood of the Yankees. March to Little Round Top. Leave none alive. To war! Skeleton Army is positioned just below us. The Library of the National Archives just behind. If they want to get to it, they're going to have to get through us. God. Listen to that ungodly rebel yell. Drink? Please. You know, sometimes I don't know how long I've been in this war. Three days or three lifetimes. Do you recall a story from antiquity of two men so close they could be brothers? Men who spent years debating the fine points of Civil War history with one another. Men who went dancing in the city and modeled underwear for each other by some twist of fate finding themselves on opposite sides in a great war involving a skeleton army and a time-traveling wow. Nazi, and then on a given night finding themselves on opposite sides on the very same battlefield? Well, if the later seasons of Game of Thrones did not tell such a story, certainly Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny did. Earlier tonight, 
When I looked through my glass and saw the fluttering colors of the Army of the Confederate Dead just across the battlefield there, it was as if I could still hear his borderline offensive voice, see his certifiably wide eyes. Johnny Reb commands one of Davis's brigades, and he's out there for sure. I thought this day would never come. Colonel, look! Wait, that's what? The zombies are here. This is where I'm placing you, Billy. Sir, you're the end of the line. Yes. This is the far left of the Union line. You can't get any farther left than this. <laughs> what about them? Don't worry about them and do your job, soldier. Understood. Now we see how micro celebrities fight. All of them! All of them come! Y'all know your duty! Boy, I'm gonna need you to take their hill! What a lovely gathering. Wouldn't you agree, Johnny? <laughs> yes. Would you care to do the almost? With pleasure, my president. General Lee? Yes, sir! It is time to do your favorite thing. A full frontal infantry attack! We're all new! Infantry! Pour it into him, boy! Fire away! My president, the infantry is taking heavy fire. Shall I send in the cavalry? And waste my horses? Oh, bro! Send in the Irishmen. They come cheaper. <laughs> At once, my president. Send them in! That's the Irish. What are those boys doing fighting in the skeleton army? They know we're fighting for truth and, and for equality. Have they learned nothing at all at the hands of the English? These brave Irishmen, they're our great-great-grandpappies. They've been misled to their fights. Go to hell! Go to hell and damnation! Run through all our powder and bomb. If they break through, Civil War history will be lost forever. Well, we can't run away, and if we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's charge. Did you just say charge? Yes, but here's what we do. We charge swinging down the hill. We swing like a door, you understand? All right. All right. Josh, you take the right. Witchfinder, you're in the center. Antifa super soldier? The extreme left. Exactly. Now move. Bayonets! 
What did you just say, bayonets? What do you think, we're made of money? Those are like easily like 90 bucks each. Fuck it, just grab whatever you can. Witch bend. My blade hungers for thy flesh, and it shall not be denied. No, no! The battle is lost! Billy, go to the library and save as much as you can. Go! Get out of here! You're too beautiful to die. Get out of here. Get out of here. I never thought I'd die fighting side by side with someone wearing the uniform of a settler colonial state. Well, how about dying side by side with a friend? Die. I could do that. Yeah, I'll scream death. <laughs> you are too late, Witchfinder. The armies of darkness shall be triumphant, and you, my friend. Will die. Witchfinder. Witchfinder General. The Lord Jesu. I must learn. No, Witchfinder. I have come to give you a gift in this, your time of greatest need, Obi -Wan. as a reward for all the good work you have done, murdering women in my name. <laughs> Do not lose faith now, my young apprentice. Take up your sword and fight. But. My bed was broken. Have faith, Padawan. Have faith. The Lord Obi Wan. No, it's not possible. Through God, all things are possible. <laughs> Save the history, save the world. Must be so brief. Johnny, buddy, come on, man, don't do this. This isn't you. I'm a southern soldier. I've got to do my duty. Accept it, Billy. He belongs to me. You.
don't know. You and I are not so different, Witchfinder. I sense the darkness in you, the thirst for blood. I am a creator of light, made in the image of the Lord or God. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you have murdered a lot of innocent women. So just objectively speaking, you're a huge asshole. I shall accept no judgment from it a demon of the pit. Oh, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, no judgment from me. I love it. I think it's hilarious. Oh, imagine the things we could accomplish together in this new world that the mummy of Jefferson Davis and I will build. We could turn Boston into the greatest city the world has ever seen under a godly and strong theocratic government. Tempt me as thou wilt, I would ne'er join with thee, thou devil. Very well. If Boston will not be the metropolitan hub of New England in this new world order, then perhaps Providence will. No! Oh, Shiza. Before I kill you, know that slaves will bury you in an unmarked grave. You and your false version of history will be utterly forgotten. I give your new confederacy four years. <laughs> Tops. Oh, wow. Dead. Want to say a few words? I think not. Thy friend was a grave as sinner and is most certainly an L. <laughs> hey, witch finder. <laughs> Fuck off. God is my witness. As God is my witness, I'll never be taken for a fool again. As God is my witness, I'll never be fooled again. Happy ending, kind of. Hopefully.
That's great, at least. Uh, so yeah, that was a that was a great finale for the show. I thought a little more sci-fi than I, I thought it would be, but well, I guess for an epic finale, it kind of is. Johnny Reb coming around to the end and finally seeing the truth. Hope, hope you all like my lame reaction. No more Civil War history. It's my channel. I got my imagination. E. E. Immense proclamation. So 400 talking times kind of king. Time to record. I gonna record some stuff that. Oh, and if I upload this, check out. If I time this right. Either tonight or yesterday, I will have my the podcast of Marcus Horse. Anyways, that's it. Sorry. Never stop learning, enjoy the randomness. I'll see you all next time. <laughs>